Okay, perfect. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. In today's webinar, we'll take a visit to the Deliverability Clinic, where we will be breaking down and diagnosing the symptoms that lead to email failure. My name is Alex Cunningham, and I am a deliverability consultant here at Acton. A little bit about myself, I've worked in the email marketing industry for going on about six years now, um, with a focus on helping businesses improve their email campaigns. I reside in the beautiful sunshine state. Well, usually um, at the moment, I'm sure you've probably seen, we are preparing ourselves for another hurricane. I myself am not directly in its path, but if there are any fellow Floridians here joining us today, please stay safe. Hello, hello. My name is uh, Taylor Dante. I've been on the deliverability team at Acton for about a year and some change. Um, I've gotten a lot of my experience by working for a boutique marketing agency and then independently uh, building up an email marketing department for a local Portland, Oregon based brand um, where I currently reside. So I'm out of the hurricane zone. So hopefully everyone stays safe just to echo what Alex said. Thank you, Taylor. All right, so now it's time to head into the deliverability clinic. Our hope is that it won't be too painful, but if anything does flare up as we discuss deliverability, engagement, and email failure, please feel free to drop us a question in the chat. Okay, that's enough puns for me. Let's go ahead and head in. So with quite a bit of deliverability-focused content out there to consume these days, uh, we wanted to bring our webinar to life a bit with some real life examples of how we would go about diagnosing and rehabilitating deliverability issues that our customers face every day. Um, so these next slides are actually gonna summarize the events that took place with a new customer that we were working with that um, informed us that they weren't really seeing the return on investment that they were expecting from their email marketing efforts. So for this customer, essentially what we needed to do is we actually needed to take a deep dive into that click-through conversion rate. Um, they wanted to, of course, naturally drive more leads to their website. And they felt as though they were getting a reasonable um, engagement level in the form of opens. Um, they didn't feel as though they, were, they had a high bounce rate. Um, so what we needed to do was take a little bit of a closer to look to see where that disconnect was occurring. In order to take that step, essentially, I needed to really get a full understanding, firstly, first and foremost, of their list acquisition and hygiene practices. Um, I always say that's going to be the best place to start. So the first question, though, that I needed to ask them here outlined on the slide was whether or not they were using purchase data. And if so, did they have any list cleansing or verification processes that they were using to then you know, clean and verify that data? Their answer was yes to the first question, but not the second, which meant that it wasn't a complete surprise that their email results um, maybe weren't on par with you know, you know, their expectations or goals. This was a relatively new issue that they had faced. And essentially what I believe is happening is other customers are being impacted by this as well. Um, with the challenging economic landscape right now, um, it's not uncommon for um, every, you know, people to see this kind of behavior. But what I needed to really explain to them was that while there is a need to drive you know, new leads, that's certainly understandable, we do want to make sure that um, it isn't to the detriment of our long-term success. Success. That was the main point that I needed to make sure they understood. Um, I shared again that we need to, we want to make sure we're in a healthy position so that when those factors do start to turn, we can capitalize on them. So that was the idea behind that conversation. Um, but that being said, we did understand that, you know, they were using some purchase data, so we needed to come up with a remediation plan for them to make sure that that data wasn't causing them reputation issues. Um, in general, if you are maybe unsure with how your contacts were collected or if you have used purchase data, you would want to use a resource like Webula to cleanse your list. Um, they will help make sure that we aren't hitting spam traps or, you um, being added to any block list due to like reputational impact from bad data. If uh, alternatively, if you are um, sure, you know, you're certain where the contacts came from, but you maybe haven't been 
um, as active with your email marketing lately and you want to verify your lists, that's when you would use a service like Neverbounce. Um, they will essentially make sure that the you know that your data is you know verified and that those people are still um, utilizing those addresses. But again, for this case, since they were they were using some purchase data, we did utilize Webula to cleans uh, to cleanse it. Moving beyond the list cleansing data verification, we also needed to make sure that they had opt-in processes in place. They needed to begin um, bringing in more organic confirmed emails um, at the forefront. Um, this was going to be really important for their growth going forward. So they wouldn't have to rely on purchase data. Um, we also helped them create a preference management center. So this would be something that they would send out initially whenever they received a new subscriber, whether it's you know, through a form fill, a purchase, what have you, that asked them to confirm the type of content that they wanted to receive going forward. And so I always you know, suggest that because I think it's a great way to you know, begin your relationship off with them on the right foot, you can kind of set those expectations there um, initially with them. And then we also needed to implement a set soft balance limit. Um, this would be to avoid negative impact from repeated soft balances. So ones that just simply will not deliver after how many, you know, no matter how many times that you try, um, that can impact your reputation, even if it is something on the recipient's end that's causing it. Um, but usually after I would say five to seven attempts, without a successful delivery, that's a pretty good sign that we're not gonna get through and that we should set them to inactive. So moving on, the next phase of this project was to really understand, you know, initially I didn't understand that this was a new issue for them. So if they had, you know, suffered from chronic low engagement um, in the form of their click-through rate in the past. Um, so again, we understood what the open rate was. We you know, know they wanted to you know, bring in new leads into the pipeline. So what we started with from this perspective was a segmentation strategy. Um, and the idea behind this was we would try to identify you know, with engagement and behavioral characteristics, um, some granular tar targets for them um, to reach out to. They, they kind of had a wide net that they were casting and we needed to get more granular with how they were um, going to market their emails. So we did this by locating contacts with specific response behaviors. Um, we also needed to look at the time period that those behaviors would occur. Um, and then we defined those behaviors, whether that was from you know, their lead score, form fill submissions, other, um, you know, in addition to behavioral and behavioral characteristics, those would be added there as well. Um, but then also just how often those would occur essentially as well during that time period. We also introduce a sunset policy. Um, this is something that is helpful if you want to identify and start to say goodbye to maybe people that just haven't engaged in a long period. That is what a sunset policy is and how it can be described is, you know, we're not going to continue to sending to those folks that haven't been engaging recently. Um, as an example, if you have, you know, if you if your cadence is roughly about one email per month, I would say you could probably give, you know, an individual subscriber about six to nine months before you would consider them to be unengaged. But in contrast, if someone is receiving maybe eight to 10 emails per month, you would probably consider them unengaged in only about two to three months. So what I explained to them was that we need to take in volume and cadence into consideration when developing this policy. Overall, this policy is gonna be helpful. It's gonna improve engagement rates that helps with email deliverability that then leads to better inboxing. Um, what I explained to them was, is that, you know, while they were casting this wide net, what was happening is that if we continue to send, you know, as much or even more mail to quote, you know, unengaged um, users, that will negatively impact our ability to reach the inbox of the folks that do engage. Um, if our engagement levels are, are lower overall, we, you know, that, that brings more scrutiny to our campaigns and how the which um, they're gonna be filtered. The last part of that is, would just be, I would, I would definitely recommend including like a last chance type email. So before you move them to this status of, you know, sunsetting them and potentially letting them go, do give them that final opportunity um, to engage and say, you know, hey, look, no, don't uh, don't remove me, something along those lines. And also list maintenance programs here. Um, 
These were helpful for the client because it allows you to make changes to your list in real time, whether that's, again, based off a of lead score, other characteristics that can be automated um, for segmentation, for sending, and make sure everything, all your data is really up to date when you are going to schedule your emails, making sure there isn't anything falling through the cracks, essentially. So we covered the way in which they're going to be cleansing and maintaining their data. Um, and then we also looked at, you know, some other programs and ways in which they can segment um, their data beyond that. But we also needed to look at their email design because for me, that's what stood out when I was um, doing my initial audit with them. And so I've listed here some of the suggestions that the customer and I discussed. Um, again, trying to do a bit of a refresh to their design, um, but also making sure that they were following best practices in terms of how they were, you know, styling in the format of the emails as well. So we start, you want to always start with the foundations, accessibility foundations. So that's, you know, making sure that your images have all text um, included in them to make sure, you know, anyone that, you know, any, um, provider that does not download images automatically. Well, we want to make sure that that's in there for that reason. And a lot of people are surprised at the impact that that can have. Um, also, just doing a bit of an update to their copy. Um, they had everything aligned from the middle a lot of the times. And I explained to them that it may seem subtle, but we do want to make sure that um, I would have it left aligned. That would be my recommendation. I think it should, can be harder to follow in some cases. And it may not be as digestible um, if there are kind of random spaces throughout the middle um, of the email itself. They also had um, call to actions. There's some of their call to actions. The, the uh, copy within the buttons literally said here or click here in the primary text. Um, so that needed to be updated. Um, we really want to make sure that there's a purpose to the copy within your call to actions, making it clear as to what they're clicking on. Um, and we want that to really to drive value and to be meaningful. Um, that's That would be the idea as well. And then we also have on here color contrast thresholds, which is something that's becoming more and more important as well. We really want to make sure we have, you know, colors that are, you know, highly contrast in nature. Um, we actually utilize a tool, um, a service called Inbox Monster. They have a rendering tool that assisted us with this made sure that we are using all the proper requirements. Um, and then load times, image load times are gonna be important for us, especially with this customer. They had a few um, heavy image-based emails. So I have listed as well in the slide, um, load times, image sizes, overall HTML size um, that you'll wanna kind of consider and try to stay below those thresholds. Ultimately, in the end, we really just want to make sure that our call to actions are clear, that they're obvious. Um, keeping them simple is ideal as well. Um, it should be straightforward. It should encourage ur urgency. Um, you know, whether that's to educate, whether that is, you know, to buy or review a product, um, feedback that they can provide, anything that will elicit that behavior um, and drive the fact that they, you know, that they can do that with you and that you appreciate the fact that they're providing um, that feedback and that value. All in all, there's a substantial amount of emails that are going to be hitting our inboxes throughout the day. I'm sure that you know we've we've you know definitely sent out a few here to make sure that you're able to join us here today on our webinar. There's a lot of email that's being sent, and there is value in trying to differentiate. Um, and I was happy to find out that with the client that I worked with, um, they were able to um, capture more leads in just one month than they had in, in about a six month prior time period uh, before that. So. In the end, um, it was definitely a success. And then we also, just to wrap up this section a bit, we wanted to um, provide a few other tips um, to avoid you know, issues with your engagement or try to boost engagement, avoid email failure. Um, the first one is testing. So that's, that's primarily gonna be A-B testing, which is a functionality that we have here at Act On. Um, I like to suggest testing your content, you know, the design and potentially the timing of the email as well. Um, within the subject line, I usually say anywhere between three to five words is a good sweet spot. And then I always want to, you know, emphasize the fact that you have the pre-header text as well. That's going to be another good opportunity 
Um, don't forget about that. Try to use that to your advantage. Capture engagement in your in eyes from that as well. But it is about finding a sweet spot. So also listed here with your volumes and your cadence. We want to try to avoid email fatigue. We don't want to have to sunset these people that we worked very hard for, spent um, you know a lot of dollars in bringing them into into the fold. We don't want to have to say goodbye. So just being cognizant of those expectations and being consistent. But Taylor, I did want to ask you before we move on to the next point, do you have any advice that you give your clients when they face email fatigue? Ooh, good question. Um, well, I would say, you know, to get to the root of it, you know, I, I would ask the client a, a series of questions, right? So I would ask, you know, is the segment being sent to an engaged audience? Um, are the recipients in the target audience of the email? Is this relevant content? Once we get to the bottom of each of these questions, we can properly, you know, strategize and go from there. Beautiful, I love that. Yeah, we do have to make sure that we can kind of um, go through that checklist before we can identify how we're gonna how we're gonna face it. Um, if you're curious, just if you're curious at all about the best time to schedule your emails, that does come up every once in a while. I would say anywhere between, you know, maybe nine a.m. to three p.m. That's a good window where people have time to get in in the morning, get through their inbox before your email, um, you know, gets to them. And then at the end of the day, prior to them logging out for the evening where it doesn't get lost. Um, but I do think that ultimately, if the content is, you know, what they've signed up for, it's at the frequency that they're expecting. So not too often, not, um, not enough either. We should feel pretty confident that it will perform well, I think, regardless of, of the time that we send it. Then we also have seed list testing, which is another form of testing that we'll want to complete, which is allows us to provide um, you know clarity before we have maybe a large um, you know send that we're getting you know ready to make. If we do have any reputation issues, whether that's at the provider level with a specific spam filter, um, we incorporate those with you here at Acton, so you have that information prior to scheduling out your email. Um, Feedback loops, that's another important facet. That's how you, we would manage, um, excuse me, how we would manage um, complaint handling, spam rate, things at that level from the ISP level. So whether that's Google, uh, Microsoft, we do recommend setting that up for, with Google, it's called Google Postmaster Tools, really helpful. Um, Microsoft has one as well. It's called the Hotmail Smart Network Data Service. So it's a mouthful, but SNDS is what it's typically called. Um, but they really give you a, um, you know, feedback and it allows you to track that information at the complaint level, what that rate is and your reputation. And then finally, we also have um, the importance, as I touched on a little bit, creative analysis. Um, we do rely on Inbox Monsters tool for this. They have a rendering tool and helped us uh, kind of confirm the way in which emails are showing up across um, different setups different emails, how it's showing up in their inbox. Um, they were then able to share that information in real time. So that was also a cool aspect for them. They could make changes prior to, you know, in pretty quick turnaround fashion. Um, and then a few other quick notes from that would be, we can also check to make sure that the email isn't taking too long to load um, or that the links aren't working properly. Uh, maybe the HTML um, has too many closing tags or any bad tags within the content um, that can be identified identified also. And then with that note, Taylor, I will pass it over to you. Amazing. Thank you, Alex. All of that was super helpful and super insightful. Um, cool. So today I'm excited to delve into a real case study um, that unveils the power of observation and strategic action in enhancing email deliverability. So I want to walk you through an experience where a single clue, an unusually high amount of soft bounces, set the stage for a comprehensive diagnosis and successful rehabilitation of this client's email deliverability. In the world of digital communication, where email rem remains a vital channel for businesses, marketers, and individuals alike, ensuring that emails reach their intended recipients is paramount. So deliverability challenges can arise from a myriad of factors, often demanding a keen eye for detail, 
a deep understanding of email infrastructure and a st strategic approach to problem solving. So the first sign of trouble for this particular client was a surge in soft bounces. And this acted as a crucial puzzle piece in uncovering the large picture of deliverability hurdles. So with this initial clue in hand, I embarked on a journey of investigation and analysis, exploring the various elements that influence email deliverability. And through diligent research, I identified both technical and content related factors that contributed to the problem, but diagnosis was only the beginning. Rehabilitating deliverability demands a multifaceted approach that involves fine-tuning email campaigns, optimizing sender reputation, aligning with best practices, and making data-driven decisions. So at the end of the day, not only did we rectify this client's inherent deliverability issues at hand, we were able to devise a proactive strategy to prevent similar challenges in the future. Their journey highlights the importance of collaboration, continuous learning, and adapting to the evolving landscape of email communication. But before diving into those details, I want to explore the fundamental elements shaping email deliverability, encompassing deliverability statistics. We'll also delve into how we leverage data visualization for in-depth deliverability analysis and I wanna share actionable strategies that can empower your email outreach initiatives. So these elements played a pivotal role in uncovering the challenges within this specific case study. Um, before I jump into that, Alex, what are some of the benchmarks you typically strive for when working with your clients? I'm on mute. Very good question, Taylor. Um... So I would probably start typically the open rate is one that we would discuss um, initially. Um, for heavy, if you're sending primarily B2B, it would probably be between 15 to 20% would be the average that we see. Whereas a heavy B2C sender may see anywhere between 20 to 25%. I will say there is some variance there though by industry. Um, click rate, you'll wanna shoot for one to 3%. Um, bounces, Hard bounces below one, soft bounces um, below two to three. So that brings us to a delivery rate of about, you want to aim for, you know, having over 97% of your emails delivered, taking those bounces into account. And then opt-outs, we aim for below 1%. That's just people marking, you know, unsubscribe. And then a spam complaint rate of just 0.1% is what we aim for here. Amazing, beautiful, print it. That's exactly what I would say, gorgeous. So deliverability statistics refer to the metrics and data that help you understand how well your emails are being delivered to the recipient's inboxes and how they're interacting with your emails. So these statistics are crucial for monitoring the success of email marketing campaigns and making informed decisions to improve deliverability and engagement. So here are some of the key deliverability statistics and their meanings. Delivery rate. This metric represents the percentage of emails that were successfully delivered to the recipient's mailboxes. A high delivery rate indicates that your emails are successfully reaching the intended audience. The bounce rate is a percentage of emails that were not delivered successfully to the recipients due to various reasons. Um, regular monitoring bounce rates helps maintain a clean and engaged subscriber list. And with that, there are two types of bounces. So there's the hard bounce, and this occurs when an email cannot be delivered, you know, permanently due to reasons like invalid or non-existent email addresses. Hard bounces should be removed from your email list to maintain a good sender reputation. And a soft bounce happens when your email cannot be delivered, but only temporarily. This can be due to a full mailbox or a temporary server issue. Soft bounces may resolve themselves, but consistent soft bounces might turn into hard bounces in the future. Your open rate is the percentage of recipients who opened your email. It obviously provides insight into how engaging your subject lines and content are, 
But keep in mind that not all email clients or devices support open tracking, so the open rate might not always be 100% accurate. Your click-through rate represents the percentage of recipients who clicked on a link or call to action within your email, and it measures how effective your email content and CTA are in driving engagement. Your click to open rate, you know, while it's not directly linked to deliverability, it can influence it indirectly. Mailbox providers often consider engagement metrics like open rates and click-through rates when determining whether to deliver emails to the inbox or to the spam folder. So a higher click to open rate suggests stronger engagement, which in turn can positively impact your sender reputation and overall deliverability rates. Your spam complaint rate, you know, this is the percentage of recipients who marked your email as spam or unwanted. So high spam complaint rates can negatively impact your sender reputation and deliverability. So it's essential to maintain a low <laughs> complaint rate. And your unsubscribe rate or your opt-out rate, this indicates the percentage of recipients who opted out of your email list after receiving an email. It's essential to provide clear and easy to use um, opt-out language just to comply with email marketing regulations. Understanding all of these deliverability statistics is crucial for optimizing your email marketing strategy, identifying potential uh, issues and maintaining a positive sender reputation. Regularly monitoring these metrics and making data-driven decisions can lead to improved deliverability and overall campaign success. So after discussing the significance of these statistics, how can we leverage them, right, to determine our next actionable steps? Well, effective data visualization is, is our key to monitoring performance. While we use Power BI for its capabilities, it's important to note that the absence of this specific tool won't necessarily hinder you because your main objective remains the same, establishing a real-time dashboard for invaluable insights. So at ActOn, we have experience in analyzing and visualizing data related to email deliverability by seamlessly integrating it with other data sources and services. So allow me to explain how we use data visualization in our email deliverability analysis. So first, we collect data related to email deliverability. And this data includes metrics such as del delivery rates, bounce rates, open rates. Um, the data comes directly from Data Studio within Acton. That way we're getting a direct pull from every email our clients have sent in the amount of time we're creating the report for. We then create a data model by defining relationships between different tables and data sources. So this step helps connect various data sets and ensures that they work together seamlessly. After data modeling, we utilize Power BI's you know, data visualization capabilities to create charts and graphs and reports that represent the key email deliverability metrics. So examples of these visualizations include, you know, line charts for tracking send volumes or bar charts for comparing open rates over time and gauges to show that all your KPIs are at an appropriate level. This builds a comprehensive dashboard that brings together all the relevant email deliverability insights. And this dashboard will be the central place to monitor and analyze your email performance. Based on the analysis, we can then take appropriate actions to improve email deliverability. This might involve refining your email list, optimizing subject lines, or adjusting your content to reduce the spam complaints. So now that we've talked about the metrics we pay close attention to, and you know, we've gone over how we use Power BI as a deliverability tool, we can now take a closer look at how we embarked on this journey to diagnose and understand the root cause of this client's declining deliverability using the significant increase in soft bounces as our starting point. So our first step was keen observation. 
we noticed the sudden urge in soft bounces within this client's email campaigns. And like I mentioned earlier, soft bounces often result from temporary issues like recipient mailboxes being full or server timeouts. But this intrigued us as a sudden spike indicated a potential underlying problem. So we decided to delve deeper by segmenting the audience based on various factors such as engagement history. And simultaneously, we thoroughly reviewed the content of the emails that experienced these bounces. And by doing so, we aimed to determine whether the issue was content related or if it originated from technical aspects. As we continued our investigation, we scrutinized the ISPs, internet service providers, and domains that registered the highest number of bounces. And this analysis provided insights into potential deliverability hurdles specific to those ISPs. It also helped us understand whether their sender reputation had been negatively impacted by these soft bounces. Recognizing that email infrastructure can play a pivotal role in deliverability, we assessed the email authentication mechanisms like SPF and DCIM. An oversight in these areas could lead to emails being marked as suspicious or even blocked by ISPs. So by examining engagement metrics, we then explored whether recipients were actively engaging with our emails or if the increase in soft bounces correlated with the decline in open rates and clicks. So we also initiated feedback loop investigations with ISPs to gain insights into any possible recipient complaints. Our journey of analysis was a collaborative effort involving cross-functional teams, including our wonderful account managers, customer success team, and technical support. And by combining our findings, we were able to piece together a comprehensive picture of the issue. This client had, a, had significantly increased their email volume, but a substantial portion of these emails were being sent to exclusively unengaged contacts. This realization was a turning point in our analysis, and it underscored the importance of not only the volume of emails, but also the quality of the recipients. It became clear that reaching out to strictly unengaged contacts led to reduced deliverability and engagement metrics, and ultimately impacting the overall success of their email campaigns. So this led us to our next phase the ramp up plan. So understanding that abrupt changes in email volume can trigger, you know, trigger deliverability issues, we devised a gradual ramp up plan. Instead of sending volumes, you know, sending emails to our entire audience all at once, we chose to focus on a smaller sample, particularly Google recipients where they were seeing the most issues to monitor the impact and gather valuable insights. So segmenting our audience into specific groups allowed us to tailor our content to their preferences. For the ramp up, we selected a segment that historically exhibited higher engagement rates and aligned with the characteristics of Google recipients. So we started with a conservative email volume, ensuring that we stayed well you know, within the threshold of what ISPs including Google, consider acceptable. So this measured approach aimed to demonstrate consistent and positive engagement to these ISPs. The beauty of a ramp up plan lies in its flexibility. So we closely monitored key deliverability metrics such as open rates and click through rates and bounce rates for the smaller sample size. And any deviations or anomalies were promptly addressed allowing us to adjust our strategy in real time. So during this next phase, we emphasize content quality over sheer volume. So by delivering value-driven content that resonated with our select audience, we aim to build strong engagement and positive interactions. As the ramp up progressed and we observed consistently positive results with the smaller Google recipient sample, we began expanding our email reach to larger segments of the audience. However, when we maintained a data-driven approach 
ensuring that every decision was supported by the metrics that we gathered. So in conclusion, our strategic approach to email deliverability supported by a comprehensive ramp up plan yielded significant benefits by carefully avoiding abrupt email volume changes and segmenting our audience and starting with a very conservative email volume, we established a solid foundation for success, real-time monitoring and a focus on content quality, uh, which allowed us to adapt and optimize our strategy as needed, um, ensuring positive engagement metrics. The flexibility of our ramp up plan enables enabled us to scale our efforts while maintaining a data-driven approach. This phase approach not only improved our deliverability, but it also strengthened our sender reputation with ISPs, notably Google. So by leveraging the insights gained from this approach, we were poised for continued success and enhancing our email deliverability and engagement for this particular client. Well done, Taylor. I was just going to say that is yeah, quite an impressive timeline uh, of the events there working with that customer through that issue. So yeah, Ooh. job well done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but yeah, so after walking through those two real life examples, we hope that it was kind of, you know, helpful to get, kind of walk through that entire process and how we would go about diagnosing, um, treating any type of email failure. Um, you know, in your eyes, we did want to kind of circle back with some main takeaways. Um, so in my study, in the first study, we did look at a customer where they had seemingly good open rates, um, lower or reasonable bounces, but they were, you know, had a few pain points, I guess I would say, in the form of their ROI. And so initially, you know, we wanted to help them, we needed to review their list, their lead acquisition processes. Again, that is always the priority for me. Um, that helps us make sure that the emails are being delivered to the right people. Um, we're not hitting spam traps, not having a lot of bounced emails, and it just boosts our open and click through rates overall so that we have better inboxing. Um, we also need to ensure that the email copy and design structure was solid, that they were following best practices. In this case, our efforts were more about diversifying some of the content offerings that they had. Um, we needed to refocus a bit, I would say, on a clear and transparent call to action process for them. We wanted them to emphasize a bit more the urgency with more kind of specific details about what they were offering. And then finally, we incorporated testing to ensure that the inbox placement was indeed healthy prior to um, some of the campaigns that they were rolling out. Um, and this also allowed us to check to see how emails are being displayed on multiple devices, um, different operating systems, um, you know, with the help of those creative tools and analytics. Amazing. Yeah, so helpful. Um, additionally, we learned that it's crucial to grasp the significance of the statistics related to your email deliverability. These statistics serve as critical indicators of your email marketing health, and understanding them is the first step towards ensuring your campaigns are effective and efficient. One key tool in this process is data visualization. And by harnessing the power of data visualization, you can gain a clear and comprehensive view of your deliverability performance. Charts, graphs, and dashboards, they provide visual representations that make it easier to identify trends and anomalies within your data. And this visual clarity can you know, simplify data interpretation and it empowers you to make informed decisions based on the insights derived from these visuals. Moreover, it's equally important to recognize the warning signs within your statistics promptly. Monitoring your email deliverability metrics regularly allows you to spot any deviations that may indicate issues. Instead of waiting for these issues to escalate, you can swiftly put a plan into place to address the underlying causes. So when you take all of these into account, you can maintain a healthy sender reputation, maximize engagement with your audience, and achieve your email marketing goals effectively. Thank you, Taylor. 
So before we leave, we did want to uh, supply a few party favors in the form of some trends to round out the year. The first is Google's new inactive account policy. Um, if you haven't seen, Google is going to be rolling out this policy in December where any account that hasn't been active in the last two years, um, they're going to start turning those accounts off. And what would happen would be if you were to you know, continue to send emails to them, you would start to see those um, bounce back, hard bounce starting in December. So we want to make sure we get ahead of that. Planning and preparing prior to this uh, will be important. But I would largely say that some of the kind of the best practices that we've outlined here today um, should suffice for that. And then Apple MPP, Apple MPP is definitely making it harder to really identify um, true opens. It's something that's happening across the industry. Everyone is trying to um, improve upon the way in which they deliver their email statistics and trying to make those as accurate as possible. One thing to keep in mind, though, is that if you do see an inflation um, in your open rates, you can still feel confident in your deliverability overall because Apple MPP doesn't trigger opens for, for emails that land in spam. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. But of course, without throughout the industry, we're working on ways to kind of um, you know work with Apple, but then also try to give, you know, provide the best data that we can as well. And then holiday prep, that's coming up here quicker than we imagine. I can't believe we're already through summer. But if you are um going to be sending more in the holiday season just know that isps generally are going to be are going to scrutinize your mail a little bit more um, so i would say just making sure you're keeping your content relevant um, and kind of meet the expectations that you have set and you should be fine those are some good party favors thank you um, so on behalf of my colleague, Alex and I, we want to thank you for attending this webinar today on diagnosing symptoms uh, that lead to email fatigue. Um, we had a great time and we hope you did as well. Um, we will be taking a few minutes to answer some of your questions. Um, so feel free to add some to the chat if you have any. Um, additionally, we will have a brief four question survey that will be sent to you right after the webinar. Um, so if you wanna take the time to fill that out for us, that would be super helpful. Thank you so much. Right, so question. beautiful. Yeah. Okay, let's see here. So I will grab, let's see. We have a question. I was trying to get the ones that were here earlier. Um, but I did see a question regarding optimizing send times and volumes, which was something that I discussed. Um, the question was, how can you test it? Will it be, or is there a specific period that you can test it, you know, monthly, weekly? I really think that all that, that those would both apply. I think there's not necessarily a wrong answer for how you can go about trying to find uh, whatever that sweet spot is for you, for your company, um, you know, your department would have you. There's a lot of variables, I would say, to take into account um, with that. But I think the more you can, you know, properly set those expectations with the customer, with the subscriber, um, that's important initially. And then kind of working off of that based off of the type of feedback that you get to try to see how, um, you know, how engaged they continue to be based off of, you know, the content that you're sending to them. Probably be the best way I would put that. Let's see. Um, I see another question from earlier on um, recommendation on the live text to image ratio within emails. Um, I would say that it's probably less so, there's probably less so a kind of a, a hard stance on what that ratio would look like compared to, um, you know, what it, what it used to be, you know, there is, I'm probably, as you've seen, if you were to go to your inbox, you do see, um, some companies that are sending, you know, hundred percent image-based emails and those are making it to, through to your inbox. So it's not to say there's a right or wrong way of going about it. But generally speaking, if you can provide a good balance between the two, I would say anywhere between 60 to 40 um, 
you know, copy to image ratio, anywhere along those lines would be ideal. Um, but that can definitely vary. And it shouldn't be the end all be all in terms of your placement. It's more so making sure that those little things that I kind of discussed, you know, the images um, have alt text, no broken links, um, the way in which, you know, the HTML is uh, coded, things of that nature would be more important, I would say. I think that kind of answers another question there about images being used. Definitely you can definitely verify um, your, you know, your content offerings. You can have 100% image, you know, plain text emails, but you can also have images within emails just as well. And there's um, actually something to say that that would be, that's going to encourage more engagement, I would say. If you're only sending copy, um, plain text, I would say it's, it's less likely that you would see continual, um, you know, engagement over time. I see this question here, um, when you advise to avoid using click or click here buttons, um, you know, is it because it's getting identified as spam or are they just generally ineffective? Um, Alex would love your feedback on this one as well, but I believe that generally they're more ineffective. Um, I, you know, it's not to say that spam wouldn't be, you know, alerted because of this language, but overall, you just want to have a, a clear, concise call to action for your recipients. So again, they kind of know what they're clicking into. Um, you just want to make it as crystal clear as possible for them. Yeah, I would echo those sentiments. It's not necessarily an issue of um, spam placement as it is um, just the how effective it is in terms of um, you know the person being confident in what they're clicking into and being you know more um, I would say you know eager to do that based off of you know the text that you use for those. Yeah. Right. I want to answer these twice. I know that we did have some answers come in through the chat as well a bit earlier, so. And then there was a question on um, how to bounces and the maintenance surrounding bounces, which is something we talked about. Um, process to block individuals who have three soft bounces and one hard bounce. Try to send members by this information. Process. It is, it is a time consuming task and it's one that you are um, not alone in, I will say. Um, if you are primarily sending B2B mail, it's it's definitely an effort that is going to take, you know, in some cases having someone there, you know, at that company that can help pioneer that for you in terms of getting added to a um, particular company's allow list to kind of, you know, guarantee that delivery of that message. It's um not an exact science and not something that unfortunately we can just um, flip a switch on to, you know, to change, but, um, you know, having those relationships with those companies that you work with would be key there. And then I would say, I would definitely recommend um, three soft bounces would probably be on the low end of the minimum kind of threshold. I think um, I do have a few customers that would have three soft bounces before they would set them to maybe inactive, but I think you could probably range that to three to seven, Potentially it also depends on how often you're sending emails. So if it's more widespread then you would want, uh, you know, if you're not sending as often, you would want that, um, that limit to be larger as well. Then hard balances, I would say, yeah, remove those after one hard balance. That should be a clear indication that that email is not going through. Yeah, agreed, agreed. I see, do we need to build a separate analytic platform to analyze the data? or can we just use our marketing automation platform? Um, it's hard to say, I'm not sure um, what your marketing automation platform offers, um, but you know, as long as you're getting the information that you need to fully optimize your, you know, your content and your email campaigns, um, then it's kind of up to you. Um, you just wanna make sure that you have the statistics you need to make data-driven decisions. Um, so whether or not your marketing automation platform provides that or not, you know, that's that's uh, up to the, the platform, I guess. 
Okay, cool. Um, question on um, JMRP correlation with SNDS. And yeah, that's essentially the way in which um, you can correlate your reputation to that through the complaints that you would get um, through Microsoft there. I do know that. Uh, Um, a question regarding time sending in the right time zone through automation. I believe that was something um, there where we could probably get back in touch with you to assist with the best way to go about that. If there is not a, um, you know, a workaround that would be you know obvious, then I, I believe we could try to work with you on that. Um, that is a good question. Okay. All right. So I think we've gone to all the questions that we can to here for today based on the time that we have allotted to us. Um, thank you all for joining. We will um, definitely be here. We'll definitely be reaching out to anyone that had questions in the chat that we can get in touch with. Thank you all again for joining us and have a great day. Yeah. Thank you so much. Have a good one, everyone.